Greetings, everybody. Nice to see some of you. Good to see you, Ed and Will. Y'all fun, always a pleasure. I think Gregory, you're a co-host now. Sarah, you're uh, up on the speaker stage as well. Looking forward to a, a neat conversation um, this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are, about permissionless credit classes and the groups module uh, embedded in the region ledger, how those work together and interact and make some magic. Um, but I think as we do, maybe we start with just a quick update from the maple farm it sounds like gregory you had a visitor that is also on this call i get to join you a few visitors um yeah so how's it going out there it's going great um good morning yeah so um over the i guess um just before the fourth of july on the on monday um Sarah and uh, and then Will and Austin from Region Foundation came over and uh, we did a little working session and um, had some lunch and got to do a little tour of the maple farm. It was super fun. And I've always hoped to kind of create this space as one to be able to host and maybe even do some live work stuff so that people can get out and engage with uh, with a landscape and um, do some gardening and do some forestry. And um, so it was fun to just kind of like get a glimpse of what that might look like with some awesome team members. So it was really, really awesome. fantastic. Hey, I have a question, uh, just a land-based question. You know, uh, I'm just harking back to the, uh, um, you know, the wintry part of the year, which where I believe you were, the maple was flowing or being prepared, and what what what's happening in the landscape now in this time of the year out in uh, on the maple farm? What are the ma what are the maple trees doing right now? Are they just growing and and being happy, um, or are they uh, do they what part of the cycle are they? Yeah, in? you know, th yeah, exactly. They're growing and being happy. This is the time of year that the maple trees produce the bulk of their energy. So between, I guess, you know, late May and um, mid to late July um, is the sort of it here where we are in the Northern Hemisphere is like peak solar gain. And then you start kind of edging into August and there's way less. I think something like 80% of the um, energy production through the photosynthesis is happening like right now. So we're just in peak summer. Um, the, you know, the foliage is at its uh, biggest. And so right now is, yeah, the trees are just doing their thing. The forest is doing its thing and it's, it's building and storing all of that amazing uh, sugar that then later in the year when, um, you know, after the trees go dormant and then when the trees start uh, their sap flowing again, as, spring starts to just kind of show up and it's a different kind of you know, sugar season isn't like spring the part of spring that people think of with like flowers blooming and things like that but it's the time sugar season is the time of year when the weather the really cold weather pattern gets interrupted and it starts to shift towards the days being above freezing and the nights being below freezing and that starts this pump process where every every day the sap starts to flow up and then you know at night it comes back down into the roots and it's that process that uh, we're harvesting from um, when when right. sugaring happens awesome well maybe pivoting toward region uh sarah and gregory uh, you know there's clearly some um big big moves big changes on the horizon for the region network community and um kind of some uh, new chapters uh, about to be written in the history of Regen Network, uh, some fulfillment of early visions around the white paper. Um, and I know you wanted to pick apart a couple of these things today around permissionless credit classes and, um, and the groups module and how they interact with each other. Do you want to kind of set the table for us and help us get a, a, a vision of kind of where, what, what, what's exciting you, lighting you up around those things and kind of where they fit in? Yeah, definitely. Um, Sarah, b before I hop in, you wanna you wanna chime in with any uh, any thoughts about our recent in person time or or any stage setting? Yeah, sure. I mean, with our in person time, um, one of my favorite things about 
R and D and the foundation is that you know so many folks from the team are either currently or originally from New England and Massachusetts, and so it was just really fun. Um, I'm currently also in Western Mass right now, about 45 minutes uh, from Gregory's Maple Farm. So it's just super awesome to be able to just like hang out in person and create in person and it feel really laid back and not have to get, you know, a million people across the world at one time. So being bioregional, even briefly, just felt super lovely. Um, and Gregory's Maple Farm is just gorgeous. We took this like awesome hike up through the ferns and to the top of the hill and got to see his gnome houses and, you know, all the tap lines. And it's just super fascinating to be out on a working maple farm at the scale that Gregory has. Um, so just super grateful for our humans um, this week. It's just such a lovely blessing. Yeah, and to start kind of like table setting, maybe I'll, I'll start it off and, and kind of pass it over to you, Gregory. Um, we are really at a juncture at Regen Network where we're looking at ways in which we can more swiftly and efficiently open up the whole crediting infrastructure, the eco-crediting infrastructure on the blockchain, which is underpinned by the eco-credit modules architecture to the community to make crediting more accessible, to make it simpler, to make it something that small projects can do even faster, um, all while upholding simultaneously the really high rigor and high integrity processes that come by being associated with the Regen Registry. So we've constantly had this tension at Regen Network of how do we ensure that projects are really doing the on the ground work? How do we ensure that they are in fact living up to the quality standards that corporate buyers and industry partners require? And then simultaneously, how do we with the network itself really serve these teeny tiny projects, your community gardens, your you know cities replanting trees on hillsides, your friends and family you know doing something on their property, super small scale. We really had this longstanding tension between what the industry wants and what people, real people doing real projects on the ground want in order to be able to fundraise for their projects, create income around their projects, and ultimately, our goal has always been to incentivize land stewardship and ecological restoration as fast and as efficiently as possible because climate change is real and we need to you know, pick the, the pace of real world activity up as fast as possible. So holding these two tensions, we're really at this really cool intersection and I'll probably pass over to you to kind of elaborate a little bit more, Gregory, of just asking ourselves, what can we do as a network to catalyze this work happening faster and simultaneously be able to hold these two ends of the spectrum of how credits arise and the scale of projects and the local versus global demands on carbon and biodiversity credits and water credits and other types of ecological impact. So with that, I think I'll, I'll pass over to you, Gregory, to get like a little bit more detailed for the people. Cool. So, um, yeah, awesome. Um, so, Let's see. So there's always this tension, as, as Sarah alluded to, between sort of guarantees of quality and accessibility of um, the tools. And um, we think we found a, a very clear pathway towards reconciling that tension to both create a transformation in sort of the grassroots usage of generating eco credits so that communities and individuals can experiment and play and link value to ecological health in very simple ways while also meeting sort of national and corporate institutional demand for the same set of tools. Um, so there's a pathway to that. And that's kind of always been the vision is that in some ways, the most powerful transformative opportunity from the region network perspective is sort of the long tail of a grassroots movement of people leaning in to define their own ecological agreements and mint their own eco, eco credits based on, you know, a simple or complex monitoring of ecological state and setting of goals and then minting credits that reflect succeeding. 
at meeting those goals. And, you know, it's been a long, with that said, we also realize that sort of legitimacy, credibility and adoption relies on the first generation or two of credits not being considered fraudulent. <laughs> and so, you know, the, as a community, the, there was a vote and there was conversation about this, if people remember a couple of years ago, and the community voted to sort of deputize R&D Public Benefit Corp which Sarah and I both work for, um, to be the sole credit class creator address, which meant that we could delegate credit class administration to sp specific credit classes that we created. And we promised to follow the program guide, which is sort of up in public, which is, you know, um, more flexible and interesting and dynamic maybe than a lot of um, crediting programs, but still fairly institutional. You know, it sort of sets out a formal set of de definitions and um, approaches for people to follow to generate a credit that represents carbon or biodiversity or something else. And now we have this amazing, co you know, first generation of credits, like those of you maybe who commented on the ERA Brazil credit, um, or the roots uh, soil carbon credit, or people who might be familiar with the, the uh, carbon plus grasslands credit. So there's a whole generation of credits that went through that framework that are coming into or already have been in the marketplace. Um, however, that it, it takes literally like six months to a year, you know, in the normal, so rewind, in the normal course of carbon credit markets, it often takes to generate a new methodology, it, it takes upwards of five years to go through like Vera or gold standard. And it takes probably five more years to get ICROA certified. And that's kind of absurd when we think about the urgency and pace that we need to be acting as a community, right? And it's absurd when we think about the pace at which science is evolving. Um, <laughs> and it takes away the ability for any normal grassroots community group to participate in like rapid climate action and linking that to some simple proof system, right? Okay, so, so we tried to strike a middle ground where there is sort of an official consensus around a program to start with, right? So that people, we could sort of generate a culture and a capacity and capability to know what it looks like for people to come together and essentially make transparent agreements with one another about who is saying what about where using what methodology and what that and, and how to generate a unit, right? And sort of like build critical mass around that. And that's what we call region registry. And, but, and at the same time, we've always wanted to basically make these tools broadly available as a platform for any group of people to come and program in their own eco credit minting protocol and then follow it without needing permission from anyone because again the deeper theory here is that we need localized place-based grassroots engagement around eco crediting and that's the revolution is more and more people more and more communities um, centering value exchange on ecological health deeply right so um, so the next phase in region network and the next phase for region ledger is what we believe at R&D and what we're about to do a Commonwealth proposal on and what we want to have dialogue and engagement with. And this is sort of the first big public conversation is to shift the parameter, which is on region ledger to permissionless instead of having instead of forcing credit the credit class creator, which is an on chain entity, which has certain rights to access the functionality of region ledger to go through a all token holder vote to be listed, which we felt like was an appropriate friction to start so that we could really have a depth of engagement and capacity building. We now feel like it's time to unlock that and make it possible so that anyone anywhere in the world can use the tools of minting eco credits, defining your own class of credits and executing it to just unlock that while also maintaining and growing the sort of focus on what we're calling region registry, 
which is the, the, the family of credits that are going through a program that's curated and led by the core teams in sort of the region network community and also continue to decentralize that. And so that's what we're talking right now about is unlocking the, the, the technology so that anybody anywhere can go roll up and start minting credits. And so some of the things that we did, we felt needed to be um, true in order for that to happen responsibly is things like having a toggle switch on app.region.network um, in the marketplace. So you can see credits that are, that were minted through the region registry program only, right? Or you can see all the community credits so that you can just give buyers an easy filter for, you know, one way of determining how much time and effort and like really who the audience is, you know, right, right now, any credit that goes through the registry program is kind of considered to be going after kind of in, in, in like institutional credibility, right? That, that there's rigor and uh, transparency and a bulk of scientific evidence behind any of the credits. That's what the pro that program is designed to enforce. But as we said, um, we, don't, we don't want to be sort of um, dismissive of community credits either, because at least in my mind, going out and snapping a couple smartphone photos of tree planting and using a web of trust, uh, like a community web of trust to funnel in, you know, resources to make that happen and to start badging and certifying community action is also incredibly important, right? And it's really important to notice that there's a pathway between the two. This gives people projects an opportunity to be able to start generating eco credit eco credits and sort of bringing them into the market and seeing what and how people interact with it. If there's demand, if there's excitement, innovate it a little bit and then start to bring it into the region registry program or potentially other registry programs that may start to be built on top of region networks tools. So um, I've been talking real fast, so I'm going to pause there and see if, um, if Sarah, if you have anything to add, Dave, if you've got questions, and I also want to note that there's some great uh, folks out in the audience. So anybody who wants to has a question, just raise your hand and we'll definitely bring you up because there's definitely, um, you know, although there's a few, only a few of us on the call, there's a high density of people who are already using Regen or deep, deeply in the community or who are adjacent. So if people are interested, have questions, restraints or ideas, just feel free to chime in. So I'll take a pause. Hey, Gregor, I have a question. You know, it, a lot of the legacy voluntary credit market uh, or voluntary carbon market, sorry, um, gatekeepers, if you will, have like built their brand on, you know, centralized vetting, methodical, uh, and re relatively slow and relatively inexpensive. But, you know, theoretically, that is at least produced a veneer of trust with corporate buyers and other groups, um, you know, maybe more recently, uh, uh, some holes in that with a variety of uh, publication or publications and articles that have come out that have kind of put a uh, white hot light under some of the credits that have been approved. But what's the what's from your perspective, what's the gamble here? Is, is the gamble that speed and decentralization and uh, placing uh, trust in local communities to uh, generate these credits is is the right and necessary place, even at the risk of, you know, some credits may not have some level of the, you know, uh, you know, that the, the suits may not appreciate or see the, the value in, you know, not being uh, stamped by one of the, the legacy market uh, kind of gatekeepers. Like, how, how, where does that fit into, like, how this disrupts this market, uh, you know, in a, in a good way? Okay, well, I'm going to say I'm going to say some things that um, I hope are never taken out of context. <laughs> uh, kind of like hot, hot takes here. And uh, I also want to mention Joseph, um, my my dear friend Joseph is in the audience and Joseph may have friendly disagreements. And if you'd like to hop up and voice them at any moment, please do. Um, so, okay. This is not about the suits. Grassroots climate action is not about getting permission from people. 
right? That's so. I just I just want to make that clear. Um, th this is about the, the 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 hypothesis here is that there's the same set of tools and transparency um, are needed by multiple sectors of society, right? So the exact same tools to generate a, an institutional credit where institutions can delegate to whom they're giving like trust to, whether that's a ISO certified auditor or it's a specific registry institution. These are credentials that can live on chain. And region registry has built sort of a graph of a, a process graph of this in which, you know, internal review, peer review and minting all takes place in a transparent process. Um, but other registries can use the technology to do the same so that people can essentially engineer their own trust graph approach to the, to be able to generate kind of a halo of trust around a credit. However, we also feel like, uh, I personally feel like um, there's, a, there's a need for community-based action and wisdom and intelligence. And there's a need for um, communities, for, for instance, taking a step back, what communities are responsible at this moment for stewarding and preserving the vast majority of intact biodiversity and standing living carbon? Who is it that's doing that? That would be indigenous people. Last time I checked, except for sort of, you know, random sort of advisors, those same indigenous people have zero voice in the creation of legitimacy and credibility in the current crediting process. Just none. They're not the owner operators of any of the major registry systems. That has to change if we're actually going to have deep legitimacy in the process. And, you know, at R&D, we can do our best to support sort of indigenous ownership and operation of their own crediting systems of their own definition of what stewardship and legitimacy around their existing success, right. in stewarding these highly valuable ecosystems for everybody on earth, the public goods that we all benefit from. Um, however, we also acknowledge that forcing them to always use a system that R and D is stewarding and the social capital and social graph and entrenched interests that even we as a startup start to build is hypocritical. You have to give people the ability to program in their own network of trust and their own systems, whether those people are institutions like the established incumbent institutions, or whether those people are, you know, a community gardening group or whether those people are a sovereign indigenous nation. So the basic tool, so this is really a paradigm shift from thinking of uh, a registry as a noun and a bureaucracy and a centralized ivory step tower that gives the stamp of credibility, which side note is broken and doesn't work. And, and we, we saw evidence of that with uh, recently, and we can talk about that. It's a shift from that definition of registry to a definition of registry as a process registry as a verb, registry as a, a, a system where a group of humans comes together to define a protocol that allows them to build consensus about ecological health and then generate units that accurately, accurately reflect that ecological health. So in the case of carbon, that's, you know, the set of standards and norms. And a lot of times, because carbon like, look, carbon is a global issue. There is one atmosphere. And so at the end of the day, we have to create kind of like any carbon claim you're going to make to be taken seriously is going to have to reconcile itself with a globally relevant scientific reality, right? Um, and there's going to be debate over that and there's going to be processes over that. However, there are other units that aren't quite that way. And carbon... Also, it's like 
multivalent. It's a wave and a particle. It's both true that it's a globally relevant sort of um, global carbon cycle with one atmosphere, but also um, carbon locked in the Amazon is different from carbon locked in soil in Iowa, which is different from carbon that could be emitted from an offshore oil rig. So carbon also has these different forms, which then have different impact in local and global systems. So um, I'm going to pause and, and I, I want to welcome Joseph who popped up here. Joseph, super excited that you just popped in um, and see if you have any pushback or agreement or, you know, just anything else you want to say. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, Gregory. Thanks so much for the kind invite and call. Um, hi, team. Hi, SBACs. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, just um, beaming in from Vancouver, Canada, um, traditional territory of the Swamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam Nations. And uh, just a real delight to hear you speaking this morning. Um, and uh, I've been kind of off of the the circuit for the last sort of maybe half year doing a few things including sort of less crypto really neat carbon work here in canada um around a program they have called the nature smart climate solutions fund where the federal government's investing directly in nature in any case um sometimes a little bit of space away like cools the blood and calms one down and and chills one out and so i i really just find my um reaction to the topic this morning and to the exciting news of um, launching this evolution in, in the toolkit and registry uh, at Regen sounds awesome. Um, I think it sounds really beautiful. And um, I'm a long time carbon offset practitioner and like purist to a certain extent and, um, you know, have a lot of closely held beliefs on that. Um, but I also believe, you know, in evolution of the space. And I think Regen has been doing top notch work on this for a darn long time. Um, and just really excited about the, the one foot in front of the other of building these tools to deliver on the use cases that, you know, that are evident that are being asked for the, by the community um, that are being, you know, clearly clear eyed seen as necessary to move this all forward. So I think it's great. Um, props. Thanks. Yeah. Hey, hey. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, hey, Sarah Bax, you know, you're, you're working um, pretty closely with a number of project developers. Um, I, th I believe mostly moving through kind of the, uh, the region registry process. I'm curious, uh, given your experience with these project developers and, you know, working closely with agriculture for a number of years, um, what kind of opportunities you see this avails uh, um, to those communities, to the folks that you're working with now, how, do, how does it change the game? Uh, and, you know, what, anything in particular you'd like to highlight uh, on the opportunity side? Yeah, thanks for bringing me up, Dave. Yeah, I want to I wanna tell a story that's very personal to me because I think it provides a very clear example of a community that I'm a part of and have been for a very long time. It's very important to me that this permissionless credit class opportunity actually finally opens up the opportunity for them to potentially engage with region network in a meaningful way. And for me, that's the project that I was the founder of in Pittsburgh called Hilltop Urban Farm, which is the nation's largest urban farm. It is the largest urban farmer adult training program in the country. Um, a really amazing space with legacy street trees and 252 fruit and nut trees and an orchard that we planted, a children's farm, multiple hundred foot hoop houses, and about 11 and a half acres of soil that we rebuilt um, because the site was formerly a federal housing complex or a low income projects where we had to completely alter and restore the soil. And in the case of this organization, it's like a three-person nonprofit, very foundation funded in the city of Pittsburgh, partnered with everybody from the city to Penn State University College of Agriculture, Dean of Agricultural Sciences for research. And they have not been able to, even though I've many times uh, suggested to them, um, have the internal capacity as a small nonprofit to engage with the region registry system, simply because the capacity required 
to write a scientific methodology, to go through public comment, to go through peer review, which is really outside the bounds of their mandate in providing programmatic opportunities through that space. However, having been the designer of that space, you know, I have a, literally in my hand, I have an external hard drive with the original designs, the original soil samples, GIS locations of every tree, the reasons we chose the local trees because of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy's tree recommendations in the state. I have tables of how much carbon each fruit tree and specific rootstock chosen by a university professor will grow over time, all in this tiny little electronic you know, device here that basically holds the historical scientific information of this site before we started to restore it, the information about what we did to it, and all of the data that comes from peer-reviewed science at Penn State University and regional universities in the state of Pennsylvania's land-grant institution network. But I've never been able to put that all together and actually issue credits. It's a site that holds an enormous amount of water with the new tree plantings out of the combined sewage overflows of the Nongahela River, as many hundreds of new trees planted, many hundreds of legacy street trees that are hundreds of feet tall that have been protected permanently, soil that's thousands and thousands of pounds of compost was put into and has been cover cropped over many years. And I was never able to put that information together and say, hey, this incredible place that is being restored on an ongoing basis has incredible ecological value to the city of Pittsburgh's climate action plan. Although I had the data and I had the information. And so now there's, there's a legitimate opportunity where I can go to the board of the organization that I built before Region Network and say, hey, we can now create our own credit super simply. We can plug in our data as we have it. And it will be okay for us to just send interns and volunteers in the neighborhood out to take pictures of the trees and say, they're still here. Look at this nut tree. It's still producing. Look at this fruit tree. It's still producing. It's about this big. And be able to actually put that information together and tell the story of this place, both conversationally and visually, and through the amount of ecological data that is appropriate for that nonprofit to be collecting to report to funders, to report to community, to report to the city, and not ask them to take on this massive institutional process that right now is really a fundamental barrier to its ability to participate. And it being a tiny nonprofit with foundation and state ag funding, another income source that's based on the real outcomes of that work on ecology and on the city's impact, that is actually financially game-changing for a small organization like that, says that it may finally be able to expand its infrastructure and its stewardship and its staffing and its community processes in a way that it never had funding to do so in its history. So when I sit here thinking about the, the potential of permissionless credit costs, I like literally as a human get chills. And I'm like, everybody that I know that I've worked with personally that does this amazing work in the world, it has the flexibility to now enter into the system, utilize the registry technology, and actually be able to build credits on its own terms. And if they want to upgrade and go through the registry and make it peer reviewed and really formalize and officialize it so it's open to corporate buyers over time, they can progress through that process without having that process itself be this just massive barrier to entry to participate at all. So I am just on like a personal level, like really excited about the potential of permissionless credit class. And, you know, I would love to hear if there are like folks in the audience, like I see Justin, I know you're working with folks with the bison. Um, I saw Will a little while ago, I'm not sure if he's still here, you know, who has worked with some project developers on different, you know, project designs. And so I feel like permissionless credit class has this like beautiful untapped potential for us all to be able to swiftly and efficiently create credits that really represent authentic outcomes and real work 
without it having to become so overwhelming and so burdensome that we never actually get to the point of being able to credit because the process itself is so challenging. So maybe I'll pass back to you, Dave. And I would just love to hear how other people are feeling and like ways in which people think this new functionality uh, might serve their work in the ecosystem. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna please, please butt in Henry. for a sec. Yeah, yeah. So, so I just wanna, um, I wanna emphasize one thing here, which is, hey everybody, if you go right now to dev.app.region.network and you read docs about the Redwood, Redwood testnet, permissionless credit class creation on testnet has been live for many, many, many months, and you can go play with the, cre the tools to get a jump on what it might look like to be creating your own credit and bringing it permissionlessly into uh, regions, marketplace, when it goes live on mainnet. So just like to plug that in a very concrete way, um, go mess around with the tools. We're gonna be upgrading docs and other things. I also wanna make sure to sort of like go over some of the technical upgrades and tools that we're, we're making sure we have. And the other thing that I wanna make sure we talk about is sort of like the larger, just sort of like platform process that region network is underway. So I'm gonna just put a pin in that, but um, so to circle back around it over the next few minutes or, you know, before the top of the hour, at least. Um, with that, I'll, I'll step back and Dave, see where you wanted to go. And also just note that uh, Will is up here on the Yeah, region. I was just um, gonna, yeah. Might wanna just, chime in. Yeah, please, Will, uh, would love to get your thoughts on what's moving for you hearing about uh, this uh, new development. Hey, thanks for uh, having me up. And uh, I'm excited to hear about these new developments. Uh, I was curious, I wanted to think about, um, <clears throat> I feel like at times we're a lot closer to the supply side of this equation. And I'm thinking about um, where this leads from the buyer's perspective. And so like this creates um, the permissioned structure uh, creates a hurdle from the supply side um, and potentially it creates some trust from the buyer's side, like if they trust the process, it kind of winnows down the, the options and what's on the marketplace. I'm curious how you're thinking about um, how a buyer would approach this. And one of the challenges I see in the space is um, trying to sort out standards and trying to understand what is rigorous or what is rigorous enough to your point. Like not everything needs to go through peer review process, um, but at the same time, if it becomes so easy to create um, new credits, do we run into potential issues? So um, does that lead to um, new tooling around exploration of credits or tagging systems? Or um, I'd like to hear how you're thinking about yeah. these types of things. No, no, 100%. I mean, I, I think our thesis is that um, badging certification um, third, making third party auditing um, easy and the ability to amend or badge credits that have gone through rigorous third party inspection and making good search tools so that a buyer can, can have a set of standards that they trust and then just search for the credits that meet that, right? Um, is the, the best way to solve that. And I think it's our belief that, you know, in a way the current institutional setup of registries is, it creates, it creates a bunch of perverse incentives where registries, instead of innovating and being as efficient as possible in maintaining the cutting edge definition of rigor are busy doing a rear guard action, defending like the previous generation's definition of rigor. And so there's this weird incentive alignment that happens where a lot of the organizational energy is going to defend like the previous baseline and the previous monitoring approach and, the, and, and those other things when actually the science has moved on and there is legitimate need to upgrade those systems. And so I think our thought is that if, if we don't want to fall into that same, I guess, sort of like game theory trap where as a, as a, as a registry and a quality system, 
we're sort of like constantly in defense mode, we need to, you know, um, open the system up so that people, um, so that sort of any credit has a legitimate opportunity to, to go through the process of building its accuracy, precision, transparency, and community buy-in, right? That, that you can start with a vision and an idea and you can, over time, as you build momentum and community and a data set um, and you take positive action and that positive action can be correlated with the, you know, the credit that you're talking about in an ever more precise and accurate way, you can build reputation and you can build legitimacy and you can build credibility so that something from the grassroots can mature into something that's sort of accepted at a societal level. And that that process should be permeable and as much as possible, not institutional. It should be driven by the, the, the rigor of the outcomes and the science and sort of like the attestations that add up to the legitimacy instead of just like, did, did you, are you on the inside of this specific institution that therefore gives you its blessing? Which I think, uh, unfortunately, and I know a lot of people would probably push back on this, but I, I believe that that happens a lot where, you know, you sort of get these insiders and they're defending their sort of p paradigm of what quality means, whether or not it's connected with sort of the biophysical, ecological and societal realities that we might want it to. And that's what happens in that the, the, the broadening gap as institutions defend their perspective of what quality is instead of upgrading their quality is what gives way to things like um, the constant attacking that takes place of markets more generally. And so I, I think the vision here is that actually cr critics and activists who don't like the way that the system works in, in a more open system have every opportunity to participate in sort of like badging, certifying, and sort of like making sure that the market is hearing their critiques in a clear way, um, in a systematic way. Right. Makes sense. And yeah, I think especially given the fact that we're in this massive transition right now, it's um, kind of optimizing for iterations, right? So allowing us to try new things and explore what works without um, creating so much friction. So that's interesting. And I'm, I'm really curious to see how we explore that all. And, and I just want to say, I mean, it's our hope, it's my hope uh, as the CEO of R&D Public Benefit Corp, that we will be efficient and effective enough as sort of like region's first credit class creator to support a system that is so efficient and effective and in and of itself run by a community. That it's not just us, that we're building a community of peers and we're building a community of institutions that buy into this sort of like the upgrading process, right? Whereby a credit becomes clearly credible, right? Um, that people won't necessarily have to, that, that it's useful for people to use permissionless credit classing to pilot new ideas and as a part of the innovation process, but that there's still a super clear pathway towards increasing credibility for institutional, for, to access new markets, new market segments that can program in what they believe credibility means, right? Whether that's Klima or um, Fallow or, you know, Expansive or, you know, a, a major, like Microsoft. Like what we're trying to do is build a system where it becomes easy for a, mar a buyer to say, this is what we believe credibility is and boom, just sort for the credits that match that. Or put a buy order in for those so that then people know, oh, cool. Those are, that's what we have to do in order to achieve that. It's super simple and clear. But we also believe, again, that there's this whole long tail system. Like I'm seeing, um, I see, um, or I saw Luke in the audience um, from Collectivo. And so Collectivo is 
building local currency systems, right? Mutual credit local currency systems. So you can also imagine sort of sovereign bioregional currencies backed by local definitions of ecological health in which people are using smartphones for photos and acoustic monitoring and they're basing some sort of natural capital reserve as part of the local minting process of a currency that's getting used at a discount in local stores. That kind of vision doesn't, you know, like forcing a, a, a credit that's being used as the backbone of that sort of activity through the same institutional framework that, um, you know, a major oil company or a major tech company is using to balance their carbon liability doesn't make a lot of sense. But yet there's sort of this underlying pattern, which is again, kind of the, the data structure standards and tools for people to report on ecological health as the basis of a crediting agreement between parties, if that makes sense. So it's like we want those tools to be broadly available so that communities can can like rapidly innovate and program in their own definitions, right? Again, you know, maybe I'll pass it over to, to Ed for a second here and then Brian, welcome up as well. Um, you know, the, the vision here is that we don't want to get in our own way um, and we actually want to be able to continue to develop tools that are so dynamic and powerful, right? That, that groups like farmers, right? can end up owning and operating their own system instead of sort of like uh, bureaucrats somewhere or technocrats somewhere always being those who define what quality is because that actually, you know, the, the way that things currently exist, again, the way that things currently exist in which institutional standard setting is the only way to achieve legitimacy in the eyes of much of the market actually reduces the quality of the credits. There's like this degradation process that happens through that homogenization and oversimplification. And we see this as it's not a silver bullet, but it's a, it opens up the system to make it much more likely to, to that eco credits serve as the foundation for a truly regenerative economy. Um, Ed, tell us about farmers. Yeah, I think this is perfect timing for this because, I mean, what the farming and regenerative ag farming movement and land stewardship has been really looking at is we talked about soil health and healthy ecosystems, but, you know, that's a hard one to measure or describe or explain. And so we realized is we needed to really understand how these systems function. And that's been the biggest thing, I think, in maybe the last five years is our increased knowledge and in how those how the system functions. And when you learn how each of the components of that system functioning, then you realize its importance. How could we possibly measure it? How could that data then be useful for somebody else in the world, either to replicate or to use in promoting that they're promoting that in in like, let's say down the chain in the food or the fiber or whatever is produced out of an ecosystem. So, and of course that means we're developing tons more tools all the time. And we know we're learning what we need in a tool. And of course we realize if you're a land steward, you're probably not a, as an individual doing the work, you're not a billionaire. It's not, that's not what you're all about. So how do we make tools that really are efficient, cheap, but actually accurate to do this and and at different levels. I mean, we have metagenomics now on soils. Great advantage for some farmers to use and then we learn from those farmers use. So I think this is gonna open up a lot of opportunities to finally bridge so that what land stewards are doing aligns with the needs of people who wanna support that stewardship so we don't have kind of two processes happening at the same time, which is sort of the way it's been. And I think we have the knowledge now to really start doing that. Thanks for having this space, Gregory. Thank you, Ed. Hey, Brian, what are your thoughts? Hey there. Um, this is really uh, 
kind of like a crucial conversation for us in Kansas City because we are sort of going through this process right now of building out, you know, what is the uh, the validation and verification and the local credit. Anyways, yeah, I, I was just resonating with what you were saying about everybody wants to attack carbon credits. And um, that the way I frame it is this is an emerging market. And, um, you know, there it's young. And, you know, we have more technology at our fingertips than we've ever had before to have, you know, near real time uh, information and data streams of what's actually happening in our ecosystems that interact with humans. And so um, I think that it's just going to the the this the the it's going to get a lot more mature and it's going to get even more tangible and undeniable in terms of what we're able to show. Um, and so just wanted to say that. Awesome. I also think there's a very interesting thing where, you know, we've tried to keep sort of like narrowly bound on the ecological side of things, but obviously culture and society, social challenges and, and ecology are deeply intermingled and it's artificial to draw a separation. You know, humans are nature expressing itself. And so I, I'm looking forward to seeing innovations that we as sort of like core founding teams couldn't have envisioned or didn't feel comfortable innovating around. And that's another really exciting thing is like this gives opportunity for new founding teams who really want to sort of curate and program in a high level of rigor and precision and accuracy around a specific credit to do so outside of the domains that we have had the bandwidth to um, succeed at, whether that's soil carbon or now biodiversity and other forms of carbon, there's just a lot more out there from, from water to potentially social, social good things. So there's just, you know, there, there's just a broad, um, there's a broad world out there that I, I, I want to see more innovation in. Um, just to, to add on that, I mean, I call that outcome-based financing. Carbon credit is just one of that, but any way you can see an improvement with the data, people are, it's almost like a more sophisticated philanthropy because the verification totally. of the outcomes are, um, are there. And so if we do this right, it could, it's, it's much, much bigger than, than we, um, than the status quo, you know? Totally. Yeah, no, exactly. It, it allows people to great consensus around an outcome that they want or need and, you know, link the, the generation of these e credit units to success in achieving that outcome and then mint them at, at, and flow money as there's evidence of the results that are desired. At, at a base level, that's what we're talking about. So it's very broadly transformative. And what's cool about doing it in the way that we're setting it up and scaffolding it is that th th then those units also can become sort of utilized in novel new ways. Like I was talking about Collectivo might use this technology to start underpinning and basing local currency systems and how they're working on things. You might have DeFi protocols or stablecoin protocols or, you know, local municipal tax rate abatements there's all these things which these this societal value, these public goods can be used to, you know, be valued in the our, our everyday economy. Right. So it starts to become the formation of, you know, it's just hearkening back to some of the founding vision. The question being, how do we create sort of a, a, an ecological health based and backed currency system? We start to see these units fulfill that potential as we open them up more and have a broader community of innovation, I, I think. Um, Justin, uh, lay it on us. Hey, I think you pretty much just said what I, what I was hoping to um, contribute, but I definitely am, I, I guess I'll share, I'm definitely, well, hi everyone, first of all, <laughs> but second of all, um, uh, I share a lot of the opinions of, what's been what's been said here this is 
really exciting. This is one of the most um, exciting elements of voluntary carbon market emergence um, that I've held for a long time now, um, partly because of what's been said by many of you, but I'd like to uh, very clearly raise, which is um, the story that surrounds these types of assets are as relevant or more relevant than the other systems of bringing financing into under-resourced projects as a whole. And so some of the work I'm doing with uh, folks around uh, the continent, the North, North American continent with, with Bison and others, there's a qualitative element to the storytelling or the methodology development that needs to be surfaced in a way that uh, the market can understand and value. And so this isn't necessarily a new point that I'm bringing up, but I'm just trying to raise this idea that if we can emerge a more fluid uh, definition of methodologies and tracking of both quantitative and qualitative data and feed that into a story that includes assets that people can invest into, um, then we can hopefully start to reach people that have turned away from these market-based approaches mm -hmm. before even getting started. And so I'm not sure if that, hopefully that's a contribution to this. Much of what Will said uh, earlier gets me really excited on the tooling side because many of you know I'm, I'm, I'm a tool builder. Um, uh, but fundamentally, uh, uh, I see this as a way to really start to feed into the supply side, or excuse me, excuse me, the demand side of credits and how they can fit into the, the broader ecosystem of supporting uh, regenerative projects more broadly. Hey, uh, Gregory, I've got, we've got a tie up here of a hard stop at nine. Um, uh, did you want to close us out, uh, Bax, any final reflections? Yeah, I'm happy to close us out. Um, uh, thanks everybody for joining um, and being as excited as we are. Um, this is really kicking off kind of a region summer process in which R&D is taking the steps needed for the functionality of region network as an eco crediting protocol to be fully community owned and operated with all functionality available to all users. Um, and so over the next few months, we're going to be really starting to work on the fullness of this functionality being um, managed by everybody already you know, R&D has long been a minority token holder and other elements of decentralization. However, we have, again, had this um, responsibility and right of being the sole um, eco-credit um, eco curator, uh, sorry, eco-credit creator address. Now that, again, is opening up. It's We hope that it's opening up. That's going to be going through governance. So you, the community, will be um, engaging in that. Look forward to a Commonwealth post uh, in the next um, couple of days so that we can carry on the conversation, learn about the technical details, have dialogues about how we ensure quality, um, and just think about all of the dimensions of this together. And then in a few weeks, there'll be a governance process. Um, Dave, you might want to mute. Um, there'll be a governance process um, to bring this on chain and to change the parameter of uh, currently needing to go through token holder governance to get the permissions to be a credit class creator. Now this will be open and we hope that that will spur a huge amount of usage, innovation and engagement with all of the creative, creative ideas that you all have. Um, uh, one last thing that I, I want to just share before we end the um, the space is just to note that um, stay tuned. There's going to be a bunch of big announcements in service to this large kind of progressive decentralization and building the capability for the community to be ever more um, the owner operator of the system that's been built and is continuing to be built. And I think a big part of that 
in keeping with this permissionless credit class creation is going to be a contest for credit class origination. Um, we've got some big sponsors getting lined up. It looks like there's going to be pre-purchase agreements. It's going to be super exciting. So if you've been incubating an idea for an amazing transformative eco credit, now's the time to start taking that to another level, engage over on high lower discord and start kind of hammering it into shape. Because I think some sometime early fall, we're going to be, there's going to be ever more information about this. So I'm kind of dropping the alpha right now, but we're going to be launching a contest so that people can collaborate and compete with new dynamic eco credit opportunities and really show the world this innovative spirit of what a grassroots community cooperating together and competing against each other with great ideas can do instead of the stolid, slow bureaucratic approach. And real so quick, that, before we, uh, with that, I just want to add three quick public service announcements. We will continue this conversation on the community call on Tuesday. So if you want to keep having this combo, definitely join us there. More stuff, more technical details will be shown. Second uh, public service announcement. Today is the last day to participate in public comment for the ERA Brazil biodiversity methodology and the root soil organic carbon methodology. So if you get our newsletter, you already know to go to Hilo. Today is the deadline to participate. If you are a science human and want to weigh in, this is your opportunity to be a part of that feedback loop in the public process. So please take a look at the information and get yourselves in Hilo to provide your comments due today by end of day for ERA Brazil and Roots. So with that, I will let us close out and we appreciate all of you dynamically participating in our community. This is your community and we love you and we will see you next time. Thank you everybody. Ciao everybody. Bye bye. Thank you.